Welcome everybody for today's Dharma talk. Thank you for coming from so many various countries. So in the course of the talk, feel free to ask any questions in English that you may feel like. I wanted to ask about um, working with emotions and if a lot of anger comes up or some get very upset or stressed or even very large, strong desires that come. Um, there's also the big stuff, um, something I'm very, very upset about, something that happened. And there's also about the, the small stuff, just someone bothered me here, a little angry about that. Just um, a general idea of working with emotions. I have good news for you, both on the small and the large front of frustrations. You are in a completely regulated and protected environment. And because of that, you don't have to defend yourself or fix anything uh, outside. That means you can let go of all this without any penalty. Outside, we have to make some selections. In life, we really have to contemplate what is it that we can afford to let go and what is it that I have to keep because I have to make money, I have to protect my interest, I have a family, etc., etc. So you cannot get rid of your sense of self so easily out there because you have to use it as a shield or as a weapon many times. However, here, the form, the relationship, the function really enable us to perceive everything as it is without having to protect ourselves. That's wonderful. That's why we have these temple rules and that's why we follow them. Only perceive. The mind stays clear like space, clear like a mirror. That's all. We call that not moving mind. In Korean, mu we, not moving. If your mind moves, you get lost in your karma. If your mind stays clear and unmoving, it starts to function like space, like a mirror. And everything that bothers you will go away. But if you check your karma, if you make judgment on yourself or others, if you think and think and check and check and hold and want and make and attach and identify, boom, suffering comes. So we are sitting here in order to attain this original mind. This original mind has no karma. Then we can become more awakened. And then we actually have a choice what kind of karma we are using. So, especially the first couple of weeks, or I remember my first 90 day retreat, the first two months was really rough. And we had work outside in the forest. Some of us were doing hundreds of bows extra every day. And uh, still, it was a lot of work. Imagine you're carrying a burden for lifetimes. You're so used to it, as if your backpack had been sewn onto your skin. But it's not you. It's your backpack. So you have to somehow let that go, put that backpack right in front of yourself and see what's inside. And let go of those things that you don't need and put into your, into your backpack just what you need. Now, this is not an analytical process, so you don't have to use your intellect. It's not even an emotional process, so you don't have to use your emotional intelligence. It's a spontaneous and intuitive process. As you go on the path to attain your true nature, it happens by itself. If you practice correctly. If not, then we follow some karmic cycle and we are waiting for the miracle to happen. But this kind of meditation that we're doing here activates the self-cleansing capability of the mind. In oriental terms, this is called Buddha nature. We are able to wake up. This innate ability makes us specifically human. And if we use that, we can become enlightened. Now, just persevere. It's another term called patient endurance of the uncreated. Because this mind is not created. So this Buddha nature is something that is not coming, not going, not created, cannot be destroyed, etc., etc. To endure that, 
you need some experience, you have, <clears throat> you need some teaching, you need some help. Because at first we really don't know what's going on. It's just like a bad movie or a movie which is too good. Equally problem. So patiently endure the experience of the uncreated. This is really down to earth. This has no new AG or anything spectacular in it. It's really telling you the truth. What actually happens during meditation when you try and try and try and you want to be clearer than just the day before. So just do it. Just continue. And then the load gets lighter. The backpack gets smaller. Your karma becomes more relative. You can handle it better, etc. Just patience and endurance and effort. Okay? Uh, you know, we uh, practice in order to um, use our karma correctly to find our job and help this world. But that one thing to find, to use your uh, karma correctly or finding your job, that one thing, your desire, can become a hindrance. It's one thing, but how about this is not desire? Desire is something you appropriate and you want to keep the object of desire for yourself. But in this case, you want to help all beings. So to use another term to differentiate, we could call it aspiration or great direction. You know, if you do this right, you don't go hungry, but you also don't accumulate a super massive amount of wealth. So you really do this for all beings, then your merit gets recycled in the universe. If you really want to help this world, you keep your mind clear, you keep your life simple, and then that helps people wake up. Not everybody is teaching karma and teaching is not that important. Okay. Living correctly. That's more important. Okay. When you explained about the circle of Zen, you described the 270 point when you can fly. So I want Sometimes you can fly at 270, but sometimes you need to take an aircraft. Depends. So can you please explain about this point, this experience? 270 is very interesting because you feel you can do anything. You're not attached to the body. You're not attached to karma. You're not attached to anything. So you feel this immense potential that you can just do anything or transform anything into anything you want. And that's when you realize that, oops, I have a homework which I can only solve in this way. Whatever I thought of as impossible now becomes possible. So what is it that I have to do now? But so far I've said, no, 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 I cannot because now I can. Now it's possible. So best is to start with forgiveness. You forgive those that were your arch enemies and you never thought ever that you can forgive them. So this forgiveness is fantastic because it's based on compassion, also brings more compassion and it brings freedom. So if we do this homework and we transform enmity into friendship, then we have done a huge service to this world and ourselves included. So the transformation is uh, really amazing when it manifests in some cases in physical magic. Then, of course, just like Huang Po met an Arahan, you can have some very big surprises like uh, Huang Po met the Arahan in the mountains. Arahan is the purified practitioner. And they agreed to migrate, you know, wander around together. They reached a very big swollen creek, no boat. They were in the middle of the mountain. And the Arahant just lifted a little bit the edge of his robe and he walked straight on the surface of the water and goes back to Huang Po with a smile and says, Zen Master, why aren't you coming? Huh? And then Huang Po says, you wicked Arahan, 
you only took care of your own capabilities, your own potential, your own power. If I had known this before, I would have broken your legs. So as harsh as it sounds, Huang Po is speaking from the Bodhisattva point of view, the Bodhisattva mind. Just developing our own special skills, that doesn't really help anybody. In fact, it creates more karma eventually. But if you use this transformation to really make your karma fluid, to make your bad karma disappear, to transform the impossible into possible, then you are doing a wonderful job. Then you are progressing from 270 to 360. Those who get stuck at 270, they will be attached to freedom. These are the magicians. These are the illusionists. These are those who really love to trick people later because they have some magic, whether it's magic tricks or just believing your speech. You can see the transformational effect on people's minds. If people become attached to it, then they can really develop some strong attachment. So they go back to zero very quickly. Big bondage. And it started out as a wonderful ability to change anything into anything else. Okay. So the big lesson at 270 that no matter how free you are in your abilities, in your identity, you're not yet done. You're still having your eye. And then you're using this to help all beings. And that's when this turns into Bodhisattva action, Bodhisattva way. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> wanted to know um, about the connection between uh, also using different forms of um, Buddhism, meditation, Vipassana, for example, and also um, therapy or psych um, psychology in the Western world and connection with Zen to use, not use, once I've met Zen over here, should I still um, look Can over there? Can you imagine the huge academic library when like a hundred shelves of books are just falling towards you? That's what your question invites. Actually, it can be part of your practice to compare these or make these intellectual connections, but honestly, this doesn't help you. It doesn't help anybody at this point. I'm not qualifying your question or judging you. I don't do that. But what I'm saying is your question is so huge and it's so loaded with intellectual, historical, psychological, etc. content that any answer is just useless. If I really want to answer you correctly, I say, how may I help you? That's the core of all these studies. So if you study anything, Western, Oriental, therapy, uh, meditation, Theravada, Mahayana, whatever, if you have this, how may I help you mind, everything goes the right way. If not, becomes a selfish game after a while. That's all that matters. The rest you figure out in the next couple of decades throughout your precious life. Okay. Um, can you maybe say some words about uh, laziness and postponing things like... Uh... Later. <laughs> now I'm too lazy. Do you see how detrimental this is? So timing is of the essence. Too late, mistake. Too early, also mistake. At this moment, what is my correct situation? What is my correct relationship? What is my correct function? So what is my job? No, when you have that, then too late or too early disappears. Kongan practice helps you with that a lot. So timing is of the essence. And you feel bad when you postpone things too much. You feel you are always missing a train. 24 hours a day, you are missing a train. You should be there, but you're here. You should do that already, but you're still doing this. It's a sense of insufficiency and frustration. If you're impatient because you're always too early, and say, come on, come on, come on. Why not now? And you just have to wait five seconds and then it happens. 
keep it focused, keep it clear, keep it simple. Then always, every moment, you see your job. And then this tardiness, being too late, stops. You get more energy. If you're the fire type, if you're impatient, then you get more control, natural control, not based on some intellectual idea. And then it becomes really, I wouldn't say pleasant, because it sounds like a promise, and the road there is far from pleasant. But life becomes simpler, more manageable, more open, and more focused. Okay. You mentioned before uh, alcohol, and we also know uh, drugs who make, make you, makes you feel uh, high. So can you say that meditation is a healthy uh, addiction that you need to maintain? Not in necessarily. Order? The form itself is totally empty. It depends on you. Some people become Zen junkies. Dharma addicts. But very soon they realize that this addiction is totally empty and it doesn't serve their desire. So when it becomes counterproductive, then the addiction goes. But there are many projections, many kinds of karmas manifesting during meditation. So meditation itself is not the surefire antidote, otherwise you just drop people with a parachute in uh, Zen temples and they walk out totally easy and free. So the form itself is not a guarantee, but the right mind, that's the guarantee. Do you know the inverted bug curve? Because it's part of the 12 steps. You know, the upper part on the left is uh, just normal social behavior. And part of that can be occasional drink drinking, you know, party or party drugs, if you talk about drugs. Then it becomes heavier, then it becomes uh, habitual, then you do it alone, then it starts to have an effect on your life, then on your relationship, then you lose your job, then you lose your money, then you lose basically everything until the point of physical death. And at the very bottom of this bell curve, there's a question mark. And one says death, the other says coming out and healing. So the upward curve starts at the point of the last decision. Do I permit the body to die or not? And more often than not, people's instinct of survival becomes so strong that they start to cut down on the habit. Not everyone does. I've seen both. And then it starts to come out and rise and uh, lose the habit and then become more conscious of the environment starts to clean himself or herself up a little bit, then fixes the, the room, fixes the apartment, starts to more, get more sober many hours a day. Still, there's lots of ups and downs, lots of chaos, lots of unpredictability, but still the decision has been made and you don't depart. And you go up, up, then you become socially more acceptable, you make your amends, you say your sorries, you make your apologies, some relationships are restored, some social contacts reappear, some new jobs appear, and you become socially integrated again. It's, it's huge. What is it down at the bottom of the bell curve that decides without any words, there's no thinking that time, you just don't take the last shot? Because that would be the threshold which you cross, you die, and everyone feels it. Every single one of them. And um, what is it during meditation that actually keeps you on the cushion with the correct mind, with the correct direction, not let you digress into Disneyland or Wonderland or the Enchanted Land, wherever you want it to go to seek some abstract happiness. It's the same thing that brings you back to the cushion as those guys experience at the bottom of the bell curve. Is a one clear shot of your Buddha nature. Let's call it Buddha nature, but originally it has no name and no form. In fact, Buddha nature as a separate concept doesn't exist. It's an invention of Mahayana Buddhism. Why? To help you. To help all of us. Okay? Originally also doesn't exist. 
it's really important to see this that meditation by itself is a method as a form is not a surefire thing for anything the Dharma is like a sharp sword with two blades if you use it in the right way you can cut your illusions and you can open your path but if you use it in the wrong way you cut yourself you can even kill yourself so your freedom as well as your obligation to make the right decision moment to moment is never taken away and what i like about zen that this form this tradition really makes you realize this super soon very quickly so what are you doing right now that's your meditation what are you doing on the cushion eight hours a day that's also meditation how you eat your food, how you chant the mantras, that's also your meditation. How you look at people, how you accept their looks, how you relate to them, that's also your meditation. Never stop being aware. And that becomes then a stable mind foundation for moment to moment. If we would like to attain clarity, we have to invest X hours a day with the formal uh, forms. Either it's uh, sitting or singing. Is it true? No. You have to invest just one moment for lifetimes. That's all. Okay? Don't make time. You make time, you see that it's impossible. Okay? In the old days in China, they said, one lifetime of practice is like a bird swishing a diamond mountain with her wing and you expect that the mountain would disappear one day so if you think like that we have so much karma that if, if you just try to unload them one by one almost impossible we always make more so your sense of identity should be totally clear and then with one shot with one clear moment you become free and the, the rest is just cleansing so really, this one moment for lifetimes, that's our job, all right? This is not just a phrase. Instantly, you can cut free. Instantly, you can become liberated. But then you have to deal with the leftover of your karma. That's very practical and very advisable. All of us uh, have some talents. Um, somebody knows how to cook well, somebody how to um, play the piano. Can you explain where this talent is coming from and how it is related to the practice? It's hard work. Whether you do it this lifetime or previous life, it's hard work. You really have to put a lot of energy into it. We call it accumulation. So at the heart of every accumulation, there's a core of identity. Sometimes you see these American movies that I'll be a great artist. The little guy is five years old. And no previous karma, no special talent. But, and that's what the whole movie is about, starts to draw and going to the circles of drawing and teaching and painting, etc. And by the time turns 28, looks super talented. But it's a lot of work, a lot of accumulated energy. And when you see like Mozart or anyone with a super talent that was very clear from the day they could walk and talk that's previous life accumulation but nonetheless you had to work really hard for it and you had to maintain it and you had to keep it creative and the next lifetime just boom appears seemingly by itself but we all know that talent like any other phenomena it does not exist by itself we make it we hold it we attach to it, we identify with it, and then it becomes our personality. You have seen wasted talents, you have seen lost talents, you have seen a piano genius who didn't play the piano for 10 years because of some other karma and other problems, and then after 10 years gets back to it, doesn't sound the same as before. Yeah, people say, oh, you're wonderful, you're better than before. No. If you don't play for 10 years, you will never sound like that before. Okay? So, talent is also subject to impermanence. 
conditioned existence and imperfection. Constantly we invest energy and information, we learn, we practice, so as to maintain it. So why do you think we always say moment to moment keep clear mind or from time to time come back to the retreat? If you live outside the temple, yeah, sometimes make it a point to come to the temple. It's not about talent, it's about enlightened mind. But that's the greatest talent to become Buddha and Bodhisattva. And that requires a huge amount of energy. Why? It doesn't have a specific output like playing the piano or painting nice pictures or cooking excellent food. This is all very important, but it's a specific characteristic. Clear mind does not have such thing. Everything is included and it's included in everything. That's why it's really, truly important to come back to your original talent. So everybody has one original talent that is awakening. We all have that basic talent. Do we use it? I really hope that we use it and we really save all beings from suffering with that.